Welcome, everybody. Welcome to uh, Top Go Business Unusual podcast. I'm joined today by Alex Thompson, who's the co-founder of Naked Insurance. Um, and he's also one of the award winners from the Africa Tech Week Startup of the Year award winner. And Tim was reminding me just before we get started, he got introduced to speak at the awards and, and he was introduced by Leanne Manis. And he sort of abruptly said, um, Leanne, you should get naked. <laughs> Do you remember that? Do you remember that, Alex? I, I I actually don't, but it's um, it, it's a it's a it's something that happens quite often with us. Yes, we. Um, I mean, you might have seen we've we've done some some billboards that play off that, and uh, we, we we're quite good at getting people to blush and to to feel slightly uncomfortable. Yeah, it's quite cool. Eh? Yeah, I mean, obviously that word naked is is not meant for uh, take your clothes off, but it's for a different terminology. Uh, what, what did you have in mind when you came up with that name? How was it, how was that that uh, session of coming up with the name? Was it long, quick? It was long, and actually, uh, I think we we do carry some scars from that process. But I think what we realised as a as a group as a group of, of founders is that we wanted a name that that said something about what we're about. We didn't just want a sort of nice sounding name that people can remember. We wanted something which, which really conveyed a message. And, and, and that message was, and that message still is, something about genuine transparency, something real, you know, something that is uh, a breath of fresh air relative to what people know in the, in the industry that we're in. For sure. And I mean, um... You were sort of assisting that industry for for quite a while, so you had a lot of insight into what was happening. Um, what what made you push the button? What made you? Was it having enough of corporate life? Was it a desire from a young age to be an entrepreneur? Was it you saw an opportunity? What 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 was it for you? That's but was it your 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 fellow founders that sort of inspired you? It was, it was something that, uh, you know, I think brewed for quite a while. Uh, it was, it was, I mean, I, I um, myself and, uh, and, and some of the co-founders also had done other businesses, had started other businesses and, 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 but I think that the main thing was really seeing how the, the industry that we've been working in for a long time, being the insurance industry, didn't seem to be moving with the times quickly enough, didn't seem to be really servicing the modern customer with a modern product, you know, in the way that people really wanted to be served, and and how both from the use of technology and from the the, the way they kind of conducted themselves, the, the the kind of ethics of the of the industry, really just weren't where they needed to be. And so I, th I suppose we just saw the opportunity, but I mean, I'd be lying to you if I said it wasn't scary. I mean, you know, we we, we were. That. <laughs> what was the scariest part? Was it was it thinking about the funding? Was it losing your job? Was it failing? What was that? Those demons that you had to deal with? Yeah, all of those, and probably half Twice. a dozen other things. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you know, that's the thing. I mean, it's it, you know, um, I certainly was not financially was not and am not financially independent. It wasn't as though I was in the sort of in the position where I could start a business and you know, if it didn't work out, it would be no big deal. I, it was, you know, I've got young kids and you know, lots of expenses and, and it, was, it was very daunting to go into a business, give up the big corporate salary and all of that. And knowing that if it does fail, as much as people say, you know, you know failure is a, is a mark of success in a sense, you know, and that's what people look for. You know that, you know, when you, when you kind of go crawling back you know, trying to get a job and uh, yeah, I know that, that thing that was a bit of a disaster, you know, that's the story that's going through your mind. You, you're sort of visualizing those interviews and, and wondering what kind of job you're going to get and what it's going to be like. Those are the, I think, well, those for me were the, were the scary bits. And I mean, I was going to ask you, because at some stage, you, there's some light at the end of the tunnel. And, and was that getting the first investors on board or was it when you did your first deal when you rang that bell or, or what did you do when you did that first deal or got those investors on board when did you feel like we this was a good decision 
So we were very fortunate, and and I think it's one of the advantages, perhaps, of of starting a business later in in one's career than if one sort of really yeah. early on, which is that we managed to get some seed funding before we'd actually even um, left our prior jobs. So um, we, you know, we had a long-standing relationship with with Hollard and with um, with with the owners of Hollard, and and they were um, kind enough to give us a bit of seed funding so that. We, you know, we, we were able to get the the ball rolling and and test out some of the the ideas we had in in practice. So, so that I mean that I think was was in, in the circumstances we were in was was necessary. Um, mm. And but I think in, on your question of when did it start to feel, I suppose, comfortable or as though we we, we got some. I mean, it's it's it, you know, we always use the analogy of of climbing up a. We always, we always use the analogy of of climbing a mountain. You know, you you see the little peak there, and you think, okay, if we can just get there, you know, if we can just get to, you know, whatever it is, a thousand customers, if we can just get there, then it's going to be easy, because then you can imagine, <laughs> and 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 you get to that point, and you and you think, yes, we've done it. Now we can really relax. It's not going to be nearly as bad. And you realize that the, the next piece is just as difficult, and and just as demanding, and just as important. And while you thought that when you got to this point. You know, you would have then made it enough, and you could now relax. Actually, it's just as difficult getting to the next peak, and and so uh, we we do live in that world. But I think that you know, certainly in the last two years, we've seen that the the resonance that that the that the product has had with the markets. There's nothing quite like people sort of just out of their own free will going onto social media and just showing their love for the thing and telling everyone about it and something about that just allows you to feel as though you've got you know what they call product market fit which i think is the thing that you need in the early stage of the business you know something where you feel we're doing something that the market needs and we can get it to those people successfully and when you start to believe that when you start to you know because everyone tells you you know when you start a business it's it's great that you think that this is needed, that, that this is something. And, and you've got to have the, the humility to recognize that that is a common problem and that it only really counts when customers are, um, without spending too much on marketing, when customers are sort of of their own accord coming to you and saying, yes, this is what I need. And, and, and we've had that a lot. And that has been, that, that's been immensely satisfying. And, and I think it's probably dialed back that initial anxiety quite a bit. I mean, it's quite interesting you saying this because I think there's that, that dual view, right? Which is listening to the customer, but many organizations are so unique that most people can't believe they can exist in this new way. And so, so what sort of helps you to get there? Is it drawing on your experience? Is it your um, intuition? Um, how did you know that this is going to be the right thing? Did, did you visualize it? I see you got like some sports watches. I do triathlons and all that sort of stuff. So you, was it that visualizing that helped as a team? Like, how did you know that you were on the right? Because not everybody agreed, I'm sure, at the beginning with your no, for sure. ideas um, and concept. And you would have many doubters, no doubt. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I suppose, I mean, as you probably know, Peter Thiel says that, you know, you, you've got to really believe something to be true that other people don't see, right? And we, uh, look, and, and I think it's worth acknowledging some element of luck with, with all businesses. Yeah. And, and certainly <laughs> in our case, you know, <laughs> We, we yeah. you know, it's very easy to look back and say, oh yeah, we were so clever, you know, we, we got, you know, we yeah. knew this and we knew that. And sure, we had those views and, and, and many of them have turned out to be true, but yeah. we, we, we just timed it very well as well. You know, I, yeah. I think, yes, you spend a lot of time. I mean, there's it, nothing quite like really putting yourself out there in a new business, taking a lot of risk to, to, to kind of force the, the, the detail the, the the intensity of that visualization process where you really really ask yourself are you being deluded here you know is, are you just, is it just wishful <laughs> thinking and and everyone's going to see how stupid you are when it when when it comes down to it you know and you know and it's worth saying that although we've been in the insurance industry a long time 
you know, almost all of all the co-founders' careers were spent in in consulting. I mean, we we had yeah. moments in industry and stuff, but but most of it was in consulting. And you know, people would have been oh, come on. I mean, these guys are never going to be able to market this business, and you know, the actual realities of running, you know, the operations. I mean, that's never going to work. I mean, these guys are completely dreaming, and 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 you know, you you do. I suppose have those have those darts and everything, and and you just need to get past them, you know. For sure, but I mean, I think there is a, also that case of experience. You talked about that. You, you you had that sense of that experience you'd gone through, that professionalism. You'd had your your confidence, and there's often that sense of, as an entrepreneur, young entrepreneur, do you just go out and do it and follow your instincts, or do you start getting your experience and getting other people to essentially pay you to learn how to run businesses, how to do businesses? I mean, if you're going to do it again, if you were young again, let's say you're just moving to Joburg, you're 25, you've left Cape Town, and you know you, you'd had some colleagues at university who you'd met, and, and you came up with a smashing idea, and you could do it again. What would you do differently? Certainly, doing it younger has a lot of advantages. You know, the um, the, the, the sort of the expenses and the and the financial responsibility you have later on, you know, are make it a lot more complicated. And um, but then you do have the the experience. You, you hopefully are more likely to land on something that's actually going to work. Than you know, you know, youth has many advantages. You know, you, you don't you're not burdened by your your, your legacy thinking and and all of that. Um, but I think, I mean, what, I I do think that there are ceilings there are you can perceive obstacles that aren't there you can believe that there are things that you just can't do that you're not good enough to do that um you know and and i think one of the things i am eternally grateful for from um, some of the consulting work that i did you know i was at at, at um, ey um prior to um prior to starting naked and and i think one of the things i'm very grateful for is that we were exposed, you know, in that sort of big consulting environment to the leaders of, of business, you know, to, to the, the, the C-suite individuals, the boards. And, and, and you get to realize that while they are exceptional people, you know, there's, they're not sort of a different breed. You know, there's, there's, there's no sort of um, thing that they have that the rest of us don't have. And, and, and I think that was definitely one of the things that, that gave us the confidence to say, we should have a go at this. So when one's young, on the one hand, sometimes you actually do believe you can take over the world and you're going to be the next Zuckerberg and, you know, and, and that's great. And I think that does inspire and fire up and energize a lot of amazing entrepreneurship. Yeah. And, but there's that, that probably that middle space where you know enough about what you don't know. And and yeah. that's the difficult time to to be an entrepreneur when you when you when you know that that person who's running the ship over there, uh, they 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 just didn't know way more than I do. And if I were to go and start something, I would just be failing all over the place. That's the most. Mm. That's the hardest time. That's why you see. I think you see a lot of entrepreneurs in their sort of early twenties or late twenties, and you see a lot of entrepreneurs in your sort of forties and fifties where you think you know everything. Um, yeah. It's in the middle ground there where 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 one has to really I think get get input from others about what one doesn't know and can learn on the job you know as part of as part of running a business and you know because I guess I wish I you know I, I'd done it maybe 10 years earlier you know that would have been yeah. that would have been really really exciting you know if, if I was a little bit yeah. earlier on and and who knows where we'd be now yeah yeah for sure and I mean I know that you know some of your values and your around your whole company and yourself is around trust. And for me, trust is about relationships and, and I mean, having co-founders and having investors early on shows that relationships and trust of those relationships must have been high on your strengths, really. I mean, how important have you, have you found that to, and, and, and what would you suggest for other entrepreneurs who are in business? Yeah, that's that, that. That's that's a hundred percent correct. I mean, we wouldn't we wouldn't have got here were it not for our existing relationships. Um, we wouldn't have started. And you know the and, and I suppose in consulting, one of one of the benefits of consulting is that you sort of whether whether it's whether you're extroverted and, and sort of love getting out there, 
if, you, if you're going to be doing a sort of sales job in in consulting, you, you're going to get out there. There's there's really no alternative, and that and 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 one will learn to build relationships and to uh, you know I suppose just you know particularly if one comes from a quite a technical background, you know I've got a background as an actuary, or, you know same with people who've got develop, you know, development backgrounds or things like that. You know you you, you like the safety of your computer and you know crunching away building code or or building models or whatever it is. And, you know, I think it's really important that entrepreneurs have developed the skills of, of building relationships, of managing relationships, of, um, of getting out there and, and taking and into personal risk. And selling, selling does count. I mean, you know, you, uh, you, you do need to, even if it's even in B2C, you, you've, got to, you've got to be able to build relationships with, with investors. You, you, you've got to be able to build, you've got to be able to sell your vision to investors and also to staff, you know, to potential staff. They've got to be able to believe that the journey that you're on is a meaningful one. And, uh, and, that, and that, you know, and unquestionably, that does, some people just seem to have that naturally and come out of, you know, sort of come out of school already super good at that. Um, it, that wouldn't definitely wasn't the case with me. And, and you know, I, I had to really learn uh, through, particularly through consulting, you know, how to sell, how to build and manage relationships. It, it wasn't the thing that, that came most naturally to me. Sure, I was going to say from, from an, an actuary to a consultant, and now to a founder startup of a tech company, <laughs> that's quite a career change, right? I mean, uh, it, it seems that you've grabbed opportunities as they've come and you've had to re almost reinvent yourself in a large degree from the thing that you were trained and relied on as an income to almost something completely different now. How hard is that? And, and I, I was really inspired about you talked around how, how you had to get to know the nuts and bolts of the tech industry where did you where, what was your inspiration who was your inspiration i yeah that's a it's an, it's an interesting one i mean i i I'm trying to think I, you know the it, it's it's pr probably a bigger shift than it, it's it's less of a shift i think perhaps than it than it looks from from on the surface um we use technology quite extensively in in actual in pure actuarial work, uh, we would you know myself and the co-founders were doing a lot of sort of management consulting style work, you know, sort of working with insurance companies to to improve their businesses and in in, in various in various dimensions. And yeah, it, uh, it 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 was a it was certainly new. So the the technology space and sort of building a, a technology business was new, but. You know the thing is that the, the there's so much information now about how to go about it online. You know, there's there's so many great entrepreneurs that have written books and and done talks. Uh, there's so there's so many incubators that that talk about the you know about the process um, and and the things to think about. Just amazing people, and there's actually some incredible people in South Africa as well. I mean, we you know we did read a lot of books from particularly Silicon Valley type entrepreneurs and, and took a, took a lot of inspiration there. But we also found some some local people who just had the most incredible perspectives and and experience, and were able to really nudge us in the right direction. Maybe I can give you an example of, of oh, one that plenty, was, please. Yeah, that was really was really important for us. So you know the, the this concept of sort of minimum viable product is is well established in uh, in a sort of lean methodologies and used both in big companies and small now. And and I sort of reading things like the lean startup was one of the was one of the big um, Eric, Eric Reese's book was one of the big inspirations yeah. that sort of got us over the line, made us believe that the process of building a company wasn't so much about just rolling the dice and sort of seeing if it worked or not, but it was actually a method. You know, you, you could figure out that you, you you figure out the things which are most important to, to your success, the biggest assumptions that you're making if you're to be successful, and then you just focus on testing those assumptions, nothing else. Yeah. Don't build anything else. You just focus in on those. So we, had, we sort of came to understand that. And that was one of the big things that went, you know what, there's a method here. It's, it's not mm. just a gamble. So let's give this a try. So we started mm. the company and then we, we met a guy uh, called, called Paul Smith, who was very much immersed in, in this world, had his, had his own business. And, and he ran some processes with us. And we realized that 
we didn't actually really get it at all. You know, so we were doing things like we would, we would bring people in and we would present our ideas to them to see if, if, if this was something that was going to work, if they were, you know, if they would buy this product that we were going to offer. And, you know, every person that came in said, absolutely, we'll buy that. It sounds fantastic. And I really, 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 really like that idea. And we, we were like, yes, we're going to nail this. It's going to be brilliant. And he, he showed us that, that you know, people are, want to be nice. If you're starting a business and you ask somebody whether the idea is going to work, most people are going to be absolutely out by that product. Okay. But what you've got to do is you've got to get them to commit. So, you know, you've got to do things like pull out a piece of paper and get them to sign that they will sign up once you've once you've launched your product. Yeah, put money on the table. You can do that in B2B, certainly. Uh, and then the other thing you do is you get them to um, like right in front of you. Okay, if you'd like this thing so much, okay, why don't you please send a message to five of your friends right now telling them about what we're doing? Um, you know, and it's in those, and then what we found is we did this, did that, was people's reactions were far less enthusiastic. You know, it was uh -huh. far more, oh, well, you know, I'm actually kind of happy with my insurer, you know, like it's, it's <laughs> real, you know, after we've been telling them about how different we'd be and how amazing we'd be. And then the truth really comes out. And that, and that really helped to, to sharpen our focus and to, to you know, put energy into the, to the areas where we, we, we weren't as clear about what, what set us apart. For sure. So, yeah. And, and I mean, did you ever read the book by Salim Ishmael, Exponential Organizations? Did you ever get a chance to read that? I actually haven't read that. No, sorry. So, I mean, he, he talks around companies that grew exponentially. And, and I think one of the things he spoke around, similar to Eric Ries, was that startups are going to disrupt big corporates. And um, it's sort of, so we, we actually initiated Africa Tech Week because we saw a big challenge in South Africa. So many people have been employed by the big corporates and people were looking for jobs and the government was talking around jobs and not entrepreneurs. And how do we grow entrepreneurs? And we saw if these guys get disrupted, if they go out of business, that's going to be a big problem in this country. That's not sustainable. So how do we essentially help? How do we help them to create this culture of innovation internally or partner with startups like yourself? Um, but obviously, you know, one of the things I look at you and I, and I see is that if you're consulting with this community quite a lot, this insurance community, he talks around a thing called the immune system, attacks innovation. Mm -hmm. they, they attack the new because to defend the old, it's a bit like that Clayton Christian's, you know, innovators dilemma. Um, and I mean, did you find that? Was that, what, was that the thing that was triggering yeah. you when you were suggesting this to the guys and you just saw they were just healing the whole time yeah that's exactly right and, and and it's actually difficult to assign blame in that you know because there's certainly there's the intention and everyone kind of realizes that the world is changing they realize they need to be innovative and they will have programs and all those sort of things but it is like you say it's like it, it's in that sort of immune system it's it's really core to how most organizations that have been around for a long long time are and it's a it's a deeply difficult problem to solve you know and we were trying to help people to solve this problem and i think it was just in seeing how difficult it is that we realized that actually the future of this industry like many industries is going to be new players that that, that bake in innovation and digital and uh, a better ethical line than than the existing players so so i fully i, I fully agree and, and you know and I mean, you, you can boil it down and i'm sure i'm sure it, that book does it's you know the, the organization has succeeded by doing something extremely well and the the processes the people the products the systems everything the culture you know is is baked around doing that so to say well, we need to do something completely different now uh, is, is, is saying also to the people that have succeeded, we don't need you, we need other people. You know, why, why, why should a CEO who sort of worked their way up through the ranks, uh, you know, doing what the organization did over the last 10 or 20 years, why should that person now think that they're going to be able to change the organization? Mm. I mean, it doesn't, if that doesn't make sense. I mean, you might find a particularly sort of unique individual who can do it, but they've been successful in doing something that the organization now doesn't need. And, and so, you know, th those are the kind of problems that I think you see all the time 
and, and which is why we remain of the view that the, the, the industry of the future is going to be defined by, by players like us, not necessarily us. I mean, the other thing that I would say, I mean, you, you, you talk about this, this jobs problem. And one of the things that I think really concerned us as we were, were looking at this problem was that there's the other big, big development is globalization and technology enables globalization like nothing else. Mm. And that there are going to be international players who crack this problem and who will roll in to a country like mm. South Africa and, and take all the customers and, mm. and, and the jobs will go entirely, right? Yeah. So, so we felt um, you know, that, that there is plenty of skill and capacity in the, in, in the insurance industry. I mean, it's, it's very well regarded internationally. Uh, mm. that to, to be able to build a business that is globally competitive and can both build a significant scale in South Africa and move into other markets and, and compete head on with, you know, those sort of Silicon Valley uh, type, mm. type organizations globally. Sure. I mean, obviously, Hollard were a big company, are a big company and underwriting what you're doing, but they had the foresight possibly because of the relationships. But I mean, that's one organization that backed you in the right way. Was that, was that a hard sell? Was that a logical sell? Was that a, a, because you had a good relationship? It, it, you know, the reason I'm asking is because there's many corporates in South Africa and either they're being disrupted or they're going to be. And there's many consultants and professionals who work in those organizations or for those organizations who will see these opportunities. And so my, 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 my thinking is how do we help them to approach these bigger companies and what should they be trying to do? And what's the lessons that you learned when you got them to support you? Hmm. Look, I'm, I'm not an, uh, I wouldn't say I'm an expert in, in how to transform a big organization to, to really compete in, in the new world. But a couple of things that I've maybe heard about that seem to make sense to me, um, you know, it's concept of sort of innovation at the edge, you know, so, so rather than trying to kind of innovate in the core of your organization, you know, in, innovate sort of almost externally, you know, do, do things there. You can worry about how it sort of fits in with, with what you do, what you've traditionally done sort of down the line. And, and I think that sort of thing makes sense. Now, we, we are very independent of Hollard. I mean, they, they've been extremely good to us, but we're a completely separate business. But I can imagine that there is opportunity for, for businesses that are sort of part of a group and mm. that operate independently, that can have that kind of, you know, startup culture can be very entrepreneurial, uh, but, mm. you know, are still a kind of strategic play from, from an insurance group or from a from a big corporate, you know, I think I think that's got to be something. The solution's got to look something like that. You know, I, I'm I'm completely convinced you can't do it by you know sort of saying everything we do now is just going to become totally different and we're going to throw out everything we've got. I mean, the innovative sure. dilemma. I think just put that to bed. So you've so you've yeah. got to then you've got to find ways of doing it externally, but it becomes more than just an investment. Something which which does perhaps get wrapped back into the fold at the right time. Uh, not the way that we're approaching it, but I think for, for larger organizations, you know, that's gotta be, you know, that's gotta be part of the solution. And, and I mean, do, do you feel that um, your like purpose or your transformative, they call it MTP, massive transformative purpose, I suppose it's linked to your, your values, your beliefs, that sort of stuff. I mean, how, how important do you think that has been to your success? Fundamental, absolutely. You know, we we um, I think I was like I was saying to you before. I mean, we we we're cautious about the word the word success because we feel we are we're still fairly early on this on this journey. I was going to ask uh, you about that. What, what's your <laughs> definition of success? Is what I was going to ask you. Because it's different not there. to everybody, we, right? Yeah, no, we're not there. We're not, we're not there yet. We 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 we're on, a, we're a, on a really yeah we're we're on a really good road. Um, we're really enjoying it. We really. Um, Feel confident about what we're doing, but but we certainly have um, uh, we certainly have a, 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 a lot a lot further to go. Um, sorry, just remind me of your question again. <laughs> is, is it is it is it another hill that you need to climb, and then and then you see the summit of the one, and then you see the next summit? Is is that success yes. to you? It felt like that to us that the you know the, you you sort of say to yourself if we can just get to that first one thousand customers, 
everything's going to get easy then, you know, because then people love your product and you think, okay, we, we can now just sort of put our feet up and watch the customers roll in. And you realize when you, when you get to that little summit that the, the next one is just as difficult. And, and what's needed is, is, is not just difficult, but it's also different. And, and I think so one of the most interesting parts of, of this journey is, is how things have to change. And, and you know, in a, in a big corporate, you know, change happens slowly. You know, um, I, I'm trying to think who it was that says, you know, um, oh, just the guy that wrote the hard thing about hard things. You know, like if you, if you can do two good initiatives in a corporate, in a quarter, you've had a good, you've had a really good quarter. Whereas in a startup, <laughs> you're doing, you know, you're doing sort of 10 things a day. And, and, and that's what makes it so incredibly stimulating because what, what's needed to yeah. get to the next little hill there is, is completely different. And, and you, yeah. you, know, you have to go into areas that you never thought you would work in before and, and, and try to figure it out from first principles uh, try to, and try to do it as well as anybody can. And it's not just about nominally ticking the box of something you have to do. You've got to do it brilliantly. You've got to do it as well as it can, but you don't have the resources to hire the best in the world you know you've, you've got to sort of figure it out and that's that's what makes it so interesting and, and challenging is um i don't know if you heard tony Saldana. he came to, he was at africa tech week this summit but he wrote a book called why digital transformation fails and actually in his book it's got the airplane taking off like you know exponentially going off and he really talks around speed actually of change within an organization you need that runway if you if things aren't happening quick enough, if you're not making change and advancements quick enough, the impetus of the organization, everybody's excitement sort of wanes. And then it's just like, oh, we'll do it later. We'll do it later. So it's like, how do you put that into those cultures of things must be done slowly? Um, I, I mean, one of the things I wanted to ask you was you trained uh, as an actuary, you're a consultant. If you were gonna go back and go to school again what would you study and do you think there's a big opportunity to teach entrepreneurship within schools and universities is it something that's lacking is it something you see as an opportunity or do you think it's more of an experienced thing you have to experience business yeah, so my personal views on this are that we should we should uh, build generalists, not specialists, as far as possible. You know, I, I recognize the need for people who have a narrow focus. But the world is changing so quickly. What we need is to learn how to think and how to apply ourselves to, to whatever the problem might be. I mean, I suppose that the sort of thing I was saying a few, a few seconds ago is, is an example of that, where you can know a lot about, let's say, actuarial but if yeah. you then have to try and figure out, I don't know, something about marketing or UX or something, it's not, it's not something that you would have, would have learned. So, so, my, so, so if you ask me sort of what would I uh, sort of study if I was doing it all again, um, I would probably go and study something like you know, philosophy and, and, and psychology ah. and, and those kind of things, the things that teach you how to think, how to understand people, how to understand social dynamics. Uh, th th those I feel Human are, behavior human behavior, all that sort of thing. And in the most abstract sense, like, and, you know, I know that and it's my personal, I mean, I, I now like try to read quite a lot of those sort of things and, and find it and find it very stimulating. I mean, that said, I found the, the actual um, qualification has been fantastic. I mean, I really have yeah. benefited from a lot. And I mean, you can, you know, people I think have all sorts of weird ideas about it, but, you know, you can sort of think about it like a sort of a quantitative MBA. You know, and from that perspective, you know, it's got a, a big quantitative element and it's got a big commercial element to it. And, and that, that is a very good foundation for, for entrepreneurship. And, and obviously, you know, actuaries look at data. And so they're more guided by what the figures are saying. How hard is that for you in your business? How, I mean, there's, there's many entrepreneurs who sort of, some make decisions just on the data, some use the data to then use their instincts and their, you know, intuition. How do you generally make decisions? Well, you, I mean, ideally you want to do both, right? Of course, you know, so you, you, your, your intuitions are going to be in play. And, you know, a lot of research has shown that we, 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 we tend to retrospectively justify our decisions, but the decision was made well before we even realized it. And, and so you've got to respect that. And I think one needs to 
work on building one's intuitions through one's experience, through 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 reading, you know, through conversation, all those sort of things. I think help to, you know, to 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 build a, a wealth, a, a, a useful set of intuitions. Um, and then, but of course, these days we've got oodles of data, and yeah. and and using it isn't easy. But uh, if you can if you can um, combine the two, the I mean that's that's the sweet spot. So in practice, it's 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 difficult. I mean, in a startup business, you have no data in the beginning, right? So you you're going to be relying on intuitions, yeah. and and then as you start getting data, um, you know how to manage that data, how to analyze it, and how to make decisions on it is is really really critical. And there's one other thing that I think is really important to say, and I, I was I touched on it earlier, but it's this question of of uh, of, of customer feedback, right? Is that you, you can have your intuitions, but we've all got to realize the biases, the, the blind spots and, and, and all of those things. And, you know, I'm one of those annoying people who in meetings and things tends to say too much. And I always respect those people who are able to say nothing. And then they just say that one beautiful thing at the end of the meeting that just completely brings it all together. Unfortunately, that's, that's not me. I'm trying, but I'm just not there. And, and so, you know what? What what we what we've used a lot at Naked is is methods for kind of regulating people's contributions, for making sure that everybody gets a chance to make their contributions. That you're not just trying to please, you know, the founder or whatever. You you, you that, that you everybody has a, a completely open space to make their contributions, and then getting the customer feedback is the thing that matters. It's not what I think. Or what anybody thinks it's does the customer resonate with this or not and that's the yeah. only thing that matters so important right I, I i was i was thinking who have you been reading and i was i get this sense that you've been reading a lot of like rave delio but i wasn't sure but there, <laughs> there seems to be yeah that kind of thing yeah some inspiration kind of coming there uh am, am i right or yeah, you, you know, you, you're very much in the right in, in the right uh, the right category. Yeah, and I actually haven't read Ray's book, but uh, I've I have many friends who have, and uh, I've had many discussions about about it. Um, He's got uh, a couple now, principles and whatever, but there's some good books yeah, there. He's yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. I am. Um, I've I've been reading, um, yeah, some pretty abstract stuff. I mean, I just find that the more things can get you to think about things. I mean, the thing that's really doing me at the moment, for example, is this book talking about um, how our perceptions of reality are not yeah. accurate, how, how even space-time is, is, is just a, something that we construct in order to get what they call fitness payoffs, basically to support you know, evolution. And You sound and like you're like, now. <laughs> just one of these ideas that just makes your head go boom, you know, and it it just shifts your perspective so profoundly. As, as sort of, yeah. and 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 those things. That's why I believe that the more we can get people to think in different ways and and yeah. think about any particular situation, um, the more likely we are to solve difficult problems. So obviously, you've got co-founders. And you've had a fast growth business, but with fast growth comes a lot of stress and those sorts of things. What, what would you say is the, the hardest thing for you in growing the business or the worst thing? And how did you overcome that? How, how are you overcoming that? Certainly in, in, the, in the first few years, the, the, the most surprising difficult thing was founder relationships. The, the, mm -hmm. It was, um, you know, we, um, Sumeri, Ernie, and I have worked together for years and years and years, mm -hmm. right? And, and you know, so we thought this wouldn't be an issue at all. I mean, we'd, we'd, we'd just <laughs> carry on. We've always got on well. It's always been super We trust easy. each other. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's just like there's going to be absolutely no issues here whatsoever. And, and there's something about just that, that entrepreneurial journey that, that, that makes it much more difficult. And that people start behaving in ways that you completely did not expect, including <laughs> yourself. You, you start doing yeah. things and things become important. But you're just like, why is this? Why am I worried about this? I, I, I should not be worried about this, you know? And, and, uh, and so that's, you know, and that I suppose just requires really being open about that and communication and all sort of usual ways of managing relationships. 
but it was really yeah. surprising that that was a lot harder. And I, and I, and I just was, I sort of imagine what it's like when people start businesses with, with people that they hardly know and, yeah. and, and don't have that, that sort of track record to fall back on how, how yeah. difficult it must be to end up, it was continuing in a really good place in, in the relationship with, with the co-founders. Yeah, I suppose I'm in a different place because um, I work with my wife and my brother. So, uh, and that's interesting, that's, that's right? pros and cons, yeah. <laughs> and I used to work with my dad. So, you know, <laughs> there, there's a whole new world of uh, hurt and, and interest yeah. there. But, but, but sure. I agree with you. I mean, I, in many ways, I see people side of a business is probably the hardest thing because you, you can control many things, but you can't necessarily control people. I think that's one of the realizations that I certainly have to come to, to grips with is that how do we bring people together without necessarily controlling um, yeah uh, so so one of the one of the things i've been reading in fact all of us have been reading um which we're taking a lot of inspiration from is the um is reed hastings new book no rules rules um in about the netflix culture and and it is the sort of stage that we're going through where you know obviously the business is growing the team is growing and you we're sort of moving out of the phase where you can sort of just figure things out using a very informal structure into one where you need to start now organizing things uh, a little bit more formally i mean we, we we are kind of allergic our immune system you know sort of pushes out any any of that sort of thing but there's a there's a level of it that is required and yeah and you know he talks a lot to net the netflix culture is built around this idea of freedom and responsibility Right, yeah. is that you know people can really do it however they want. There's no need to please the boss. There's no need to get approvals for everything. You know, they're the ones that have got yeah. no leave leave policy and no expense policy and all these kind of things. And 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 I think that's something that that I feel strong affinity with this idea of saying to people, you know, this is your responsibility, and I'm very happy to chat to you about it and, and give you my views. But at the end of the day, it is with you. And it is 100% up to you how to go about it. And if you want to do it 100% differently to the way that I would do it, that is completely fine. You do not have to yeah. get me on page on that. And and yeah, and so I'm I'm excited about those kind of ideas and the way that, that Netflix has gone about this and and see and to see sort of to what extent we can we can borrow from some of those ideas and make it. Yeah, it's quite interesting, eh? And and I mean, obviously, you work with your co-founders for quite a while both in the business and beforehand and i mean do, do, do you think part of your success is that you have different attributes because you came from similar industries similar companies mm. but do you think mm. that, that you bring different things to the party is that what is making it work or absolutely no, there's no question absolutely no question and you know i think that most investors you know sort of at the seed level wouldn't have backed us because we all have such a similar background, you know, and we all, we're all actuaries. We, you know, like, you know, you think like, what, why would you want to, you, know, you got to get people from different backgrounds. But if you, if you know us and if you, you know, if you, if you've worked with us, you realize that actually we like completely different. We've got completely different strengths. And, and I think each of us individually is very um, incomplete as, as an individual. We are not the perfect person who can do everything you know we we all have our strengths and our weaknesses but together i think we we cover most of the bases and and and, and i think it's it's certainly been the case and i mean obviously when you have different people working together it, it can give rise to you know some robust conversations uh, because you have different perspectives on things and but it, it's it's undoubtedly supported the progress we've made so far I mean, that's awesome. I mean, you talk about the growth and the team and there's been this exponential growth almost of your team. And sort of, I, I, I sometimes wonder starting out, how hard was it to get the right people? Because what often I see is getting the right people is going to mean the difference between succeeding or not succeeding. How hard was it to attract those right people for you guys? And how did you do it? Yeah. I think we were just really lucky, you know. Uh, it's it's um, so really hard. You know, <laughs> I think you went, we have to be honest about it. I mean, like we we really yeah. did pick up some really exceptional people through, you know, just being at the right place in the right time, at the right time. And and 
And uh, but but also just you know we we have got a lot of experience with recruitment you know so um, we've run teams for for a long time and and so learned a, a few things about about how to go about it and and what sort of things to look for and 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 being picky I mean you just have to be picky and just don't you know you, you there's this tendency to have this you know this this kind of headcount growth picture or you know sort of milestones you want to reach and, and things like that and, and you also just get to a point where you're so sick of doing something you need somebody to come in and take that job away from you and you know you, you just want to find the first person that can do it and but just to be really patient and keep looking and speak to more and more and more people and uh and and then sharpen up on on the on on that that purpose point that you mentioned how to communicate mm. why are we here what we're trying to do why this is significant why i mean as you know obviously steve jobs was the was the master of this yeah uh, you know so so you know you can take some inspiration from him but just how to communicate that vision succinctly to a to a potential staff member so that they can sort of you know so it makes them feel as though their current sort of corporate job or whatever really is, is it might be well paying but that's all that's the only good thing you can say about it you know Oh. So, I mean, for a lot of I suppose startups, I mean, I was speaking to Andrea Borat from Knife Capital, and she was saying that sort of most founders or businesses are looking for three things, funding, networks, or knowledge. And, you know, I, I, one of the speakers at Africa Tech Week was saying that Africa's getting about $20 billion worth of funding a year. It was Two million about fifteen years ago, so it's it's grown exponentially. How important is funding into growing this economy and and helping us? And and how do we drive that more? You know, is there is there an organisation do you think that's going to come along? We've talked about the banking sector now, the insurance sector that's advanced, but it seems the funding sector for businesses, certainly in Africa, is some big opportunities. Yeah, funding is challenging for sure. Uh, and, and you know what we need is confidence in the future of the economy. I mean, certainly speaking in South Africa, that that's a, an issue. I mean, there's different dynamics in some of the other big big markets in Africa. You know, funders will come when the opportunity is there. There's there's you know there's no sort of uh, there's nothing more to it than that. I mean, people don't invest because they yeah. don't think they're going to get the return. But there's also a human a human thing. And, you know, when there's uncertainty, when there's policy uncertainty, political uncertainty, then people, you know, don't know that the wool won't, the, the rug won't be pulled out from under their feet. So, so they're less likely to invest. So the more certainty you can create, the more sort of predictability, frankly, even if it's relatively pedestrian growth, but just knowing that things are going to continue more along, more less the way they are or, or you know, moving in the right direction is is what you need to, to to give investors some sort of confidence so yes i mean in, in south africa it is it is tough you know i mean there's so much money washing around in in the, in the us and europe and i mean i suppose most most places and it's and it is it is a lot less in in africa but it, like you say it's improving and what we need is more successes right so the more businesses that can generate incredible returns for investors the more people will be able to motivate to to invest a bigger bigger portion of their pie in Africa, and more funds will start, and, and so on. And we haven't really spoken about your business, but I mean, in terms of how it's grown and what your ambitions are. I mean, are you guys looking at other markets outside of South Africa? Are you focused on diversifying to different segments? I know you're into car and home, and um, I do a bit of surfing, so I'm going to look up your your rates for covering my surfboards. But um, so yeah. so, is it looking within South Africa and looking at different markets, or is it in fact looking outside of South Africa? Where's your where do you see the opportunities? Yeah, certainly at the moment, our our, our primary focus is South Africa, and we we have got a you know, a long way to go in in this market before we want to uh, you know split our focus too much. But at the same time, we do see opportunity in in other markets, and and we are sort of tentatively looking at some of those markets. And at some point, we'll 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 probably go into into other countries. But uh, you know, there's South Africa is a competitive insurance market. There are extremely good players, and 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 like I said, you know, we, we've got a lot more we want to do here. We, uh, you know, we, we, we really, in the beginning, we set out to do 
your your sort of personal uh, short-term insurance needs, you know, your car, your home. And, and as you mentioned, we cover these single items, like if you just want to cover a bicycle or a surfboard or a smartwatch or something, we can we can do that. Mm. So that was that was really the, the sort of one of those little peaks that we're talking about, just getting to a point where we were offering all of those things, which which we reached in, in January last year, about a year ago. And and uh, you know, and so you know, now we, you know, and that's and that's resonated really well with the market. Um, being able to sort of cover all of your things uh, that that's gone really nicely and and yeah so now we start looking at other things and and, and the question of, of where to go next for sure exciting i also saw that um you know when i traveled to the us i see a big focus on customer service and satisfaction as almost a driving principle for organizations success and I suppose in a way you could call it customer experience in terms of the digital world um, you have your hello Peter sort of referrals on your website and everything how big of a part of your growth was that strategy to focus on those referrals and those things or did you sort of stumble upon it yeah so right from the beginning the so sort the of simplest way of understanding what we're doing is to realize that the relationship that most people have with their insurer or with their insurance is not a healthy one, right? It's it's either sort of neutral at best or sort of, you know, grudge purchase kind of feeling or it's extremely negative and distrustful and, and that, and it's something within that spectrum. But it, it, it almost never veers into the positive, right? You can never say, oh, I just love my insurance. You might say, <laughs> I love Netflix or DSTV or whatever, but you, you're very unlikely to say, you know, I, I, I love my insurance. And, and that was really what, what we set out to do was to, was to make it something that people think this is really cool. Like, uh, you know, I mean, we, we, we recognize it's insurance and it's, it's probably never going to get into Netflix territory, but that's the ambition, right? That's what we want to make people feel. And, and that requires not, you know, it's not a marketing problem per se. That is a problem yeah. of, of understanding why, why people have such a negative view of insurance, you know, and, and tackling those things at their root. You know, for example, most insurance companies try to speak to their customers as little as possible. Why? Because when they speak to them, they go, oh, shucks, I'm paying all this money on this insurance. I must really go and shop around or cancel. So then they learn just from the data again that they shouldn't be speaking to their customers. We think that's just very short-sighted and sort of misses the opportunity. So what we try to do is to speak, or to, I mean, we don't want to spam our customers, but, you know, we want to, we want to sort of build an engaged relationship you know so we've got this thing called cover pause where you can go and pause the accident cover on your car when you're not driving you know those kind of things are, are ways of improving the level of engagement making people go oh i like i like this you know this is this is cool you know it's something that that that's a little bit more fun a bit more enjoyable than than would normally be the case and and yeah so you know th and that's a big part of what we're trying to do is mend that relationship and and, and put it into a totally different category I think it was Anthony Robbins' book, Money, and he actually was, it was quite weird because he interviews like Ray Dalio and all the other investment guys, but one of the principles he talks about with money and wealth creation was looking at insurance, not as a grudge purchase, but as an investment, um, and not just for your for life insurance, all those sorts of insurances, um, and, and turning it from that grudge to a great investment. Are you seeing, is that, is that a, a challenge to change that narrative? Is that a, a, an opportunity? We, look, we, we certainly do see people feeling very different about their, about their insurance with us. And I mean, you can whip onto social media and there's lots of people saying, saying very positive things. You know, the, the, the investment analogy and in when it comes to short-term insurance is um, a little bit tenuous, but you can, you can, you can make the link. You know, the... To, to get the best value for your insurance, you need to have a track record. You know, it's a bit like a, it's, it's a bit like, you know, sort of credit score or something like that, where you, you, if you do the right things, you look after your things, you drive carefully, you, you know, you, you're careful about your security and all those sort of things. You build up a good track record with your insurance. And that will mean that you will get better value for your insurance from anyone, right? Everybody will ask you those questions and everybody will charge you less if you haven't had prior um, prior claims, so you know it is it is it is a little bit of an investment in that way, and something to 
to take yeah. you know to take seriously you you know you, you feel you're covered but it's a partnership right is that yeah you know, we we the whole system works better when we all do the right thing and and you know, that's part of that relationship i was talking about where we want people to be you know have the best possible cover but we, we and, and and we want to behave in a way that is on your side as the customer we don't want to be sort of in that conflictual relationship where we make extra money if we don't pay claims which is what we've changed in the sort of mechanics of, of the way that our business works and and so so you know we're not in sort of opposition with you but then the other side of it is you know that when you're thinking about you know your tv's being stolen and you're thinking you know yeah i'm sure i had that really top of the range one, you know, <laughs> when you actually had the very bottom of the range one what you're realizing is that when you overclaim from us it doesn't come out of our pockets right it comes out of a yeah. charity that you've chosen so we, yeah. we we sort of you know we we, we sort of trying to to shift the yeah. the the way the whole system works because when you fix those things what what happens is yes you get better sort of customer loyalty yeah. and people sort of have greater confidence in the product but also what happens is you have less people needing to be running around validating that what you're saying is true and and that sort of thing and prices yeah. come down you know yeah. and and we all want to spend less on something like insurance right i think generally south africa has a you know we, we, uh, corruption is high and we go on about the government but i think consumers probably no different and i read somewhere that about 30% of all claims are fraudulent and that's one of the biggest cost challenges and invasions of our privacy and how do we change it is that is that a behavioral incentive that that you look to or is it a cultural mindset that we need to you know how do you see that changing how do you see because it's not just affecting insurance it's affecting everything in the way that we it's it's built on trust right there's this inherent trust that is important to build in our society yes yes and so the way that 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 we try to tackle this is by just looking at basic human behavior and how people tend to respond in different circumstances it's absolutely true when you see other people when you when you believe that other people are stealing you're much more likely to steal yourself right mm -hmm. you because you, you think well if they're doing it then i can do it right mm -hmm. and and that's a, often the way that people feel about insurance that this this company is is you know being dishonest is not not honoring their side of the bargain so why should i honor mine so mm -hmm. so in the context of insurance at least that's why we're trying to sort of say well we have no reason to to behave dishonestly to to manipulate you to sort of you know like profile you and figure out that you're the sort of person that's not going to challenge anything so we can just tell you no and you're just going to run off you know we have no reason to do any of those kind of things right and and in fact what we really want is to give you a, a, the best possible service so that you're going to stay for a long time that's how we're going to make money not by not paying your claims and and so if we if we can do those things and then we can nudge um in the right way you know we can nudge people's behavior to do things that are good for everyone then you know and we we don't think that it's going to sort of take that 30% and make it 2% no but even if we can get it down by 5% that's 5% less everybody yeah. pays and yeah. and and that's and that's a really important contribution to society in in our view sure and i i was thinking almost like um employee employer relationships or contracts it's very similar right one's feeling yeah. that one using the other one and so it's about how do we build trust in all contracts um you know families everything yeah. and um, one of the enablers for trust is transparency right or, and you know so so if one is able to you know say what one's going to do and then show that one's done it in a in as transparent a way as possible that we think that's a good foundation for for trust we we feel distrustful when there's the sort of murkiness going on and you wonder there's more to the story than than meets the eye so my my wife does a lot of our insurance and buying probably with most families so i knew i was doing the podcast with you and i said to her, get on there and and start looking at prices so um hopefully you get Great more customers like me and and we're yes. obviously wishing you um the very best of luck and success but i suppose my Thank my you. final question is is and i asked at the beginning which is what what does actually success look like to to alex what what does success look like to you i guess i'm a, i'm an idealist i want to have a positive impact in the world 
you know, I want to do something that I can feel proud of, that I can feel as though my time, you know, on this planet was well spent. I'm not motivated to have the biggest house or the best car. I, I'm motivated to feel as though I've taken my talents as much as I have them and employed them in a way that is good for people around me, good for the world. That's, that's what keeps me focused and motivated and, and trying to do the best that I can at Naked. Wow. I see you've got that watch, so no doubt you're a runner, a cyclist, and, and hopefully we see you out in the outdoors. Uh, I told you I do triathlons. It was really great speaking to you. Congratulations for last year. Good luck for this year. And I think we're trying to get you to speak at Africa Tech Week again in May. So it'd be yes. great to get those insights. Thanks so Looking much for your time. No, no, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed talking to you. Thanks. Thanks. It's been lovely. Pleasure.